Hey, welcome to another episode of the Bible in Life podcast where I like to give what I call blue jeans theology. That is theology that's in the language of everyday life, in the context of everyday life, theology for everyday life. All right, we began a brand new series last week on the podcast on the topic of prayer, specifically on the topic of learning to pray from Jesus and letting Jesus be our teacher in the school of prayer. And we looked last week on the podcast at really Jesus' pattern of prayer, how it was such a part and parcel of his life that Jesus could be said to live, not just have a, a prayer life, but he lived a life of prayer. And that's really the example for us. And so we want to learn from Jesus how to pray and what, what it means to pray. And specifically on this episode, I want us to think about who we pray to and what kind of relationship we're invited into when we pray. What is God like? How does he want to relate to us? How does he want to be known by us? And, and that really is embodied in the way Jesus teaches us to pray. And this is highlighted right at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer in the way Jesus teaches us to address God. The way we uh, address someone really in some ways captures the nature of the relationship. For example, I taught for a number of years at a local Bible college, and the students were required by the college to address their professors, at least in class, with their formal title. And so my title was either Mr. Whitaker or Dr. Whitaker, and that was what the students knew me as. That's how they related to me. So much so that uh, it's not uncommon for students who graduated five, six, seven years ago to still call me by that title. That's how they know me. That's the relationship they have. And some of them even say, man, I just can't get myself to call you John. The interesting thing is, is sometimes those students would, would go to church with me and um, they would see me at church. They would get excited to see me. They would come up to me and they would say, oh, hi, Dr. Whitaker. Well, now I'm at church and the people at church only know me as John. That's just the way they've always known me. And so all of a sudden, here comes a student who calls me Dr. Whitaker. And it wasn't uncommon for then people at church to kind of chuckle and think, Dr. Whitaker, right? And they thought that was kind of odd because they knew me as John. The nature of the address speaks in some regard to the kind of relationship that we have with a person. Well, how does Jesus teach us to address God, and what kind of relationship does that speak of? Well, look at the Lord's Prayer. The well-known version of that is found in Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus teaches us to address God this way. He says, Our Father in heaven. That's how he wants us to pray. To our Father in in heaven. The word Father in Aramaic, which was the native language of Jesus, the language he would have spoken every day, well, the word Father there is Abba. In Jesus' cultural context, that word Abba not only was used for dad in the home, it was also sometimes used between uh, a disciple and a rabbi, where the disciple would call the rabbi Abba. Father, And so it's a term that spoke both of intimacy as well as honor and respect. And I think that's appropriate in our relationship with God to, to remember that this word Abba, Pater, Dad, includes both uh, respect and honor as well as familiarity, closeness, and intimacy. And that's the way Jesus wants us to relate to God. And it's the way Jesus himself related to God. Mark chapter 14, verse 36, it's the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. He is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying there. And Mark records Jesus' prayer for us. And in his prayer, Jesus actually addresses God the very way he's teaching us to address God here in the Lord's Prayer. In Mark 14, 36, Jesus says, Abba, Dad. In fact, Mark translates Abba with Pater, Father, Abba. Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. And he's addressing God as dad with that intimacy, that familiarity, that closeness. Even in the midst of his turmoil, he has that kind of relationship with God as not just great, magnificent creator, but Abba, dad, father. And that's the way he's instructing us to pray to God as well. Um. Not only that, that this, this way of describing God is the very heart cry that the Spirit of God himself 
the Apostle Paul says, pours out in our hearts so that we have this very same relationship with God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, for example, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received the spirit of adoptions as son. And we've been adopted into God's family as his children, and so we've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, Dad. And that's the very way the Spirit himself, working in our life, moves us to call out to God as Dad, as Abba, as Father. And so that's the very way we're really invited and instructed to relate to God as Dad, as Father. Now there's this idea oftentimes among Christians that this was completely 100% unique between Jesus and God and thus between Jesus' followers and God. In other words, that the Jews never prayed to God as Father. But that's, that's a bit of an overstatement. In fact, in the 18 prayers that the Jews used as part of their regular uh, prayer life, two of those 18 prayers actually address God with this very title, Our Father. And we see in the Old Testament that God is regularly compared to a father. Never directly addressed that way in the Old Testament, but he's regularly compared to the father of his people. And so this wasn't uncommon. It wasn't completely out of balance or completely foreign to the Jews to think of God as father and even to address God as father. It does seem, however, that it was a little bit distinctive for Jesus with the sense of intimacy, the sense of closeness. And what Jesus then inviting us into by virtue of his very own spirit who dwells in us, who calls us to address God this way. So it's not 100% unique, but I think the level of intimacy probably is a bit distinct between Jesus and God and thus between Jesus' followers and God as well. And so we are invited into this relationship with God as Abba, Father. Dad. One of the real challenges with being invited into that kind of relationship and addressing God that way is sometimes our own experience of fathers, our own experience with our own dad, can affect the nature of that relationship. And so we have to think very clearly about this. When Jesus invites us to address God as Dad, Abba, what kind of dad is he inviting us to address? You know, I understand this challenge particularly because uh, my dad left when I was three and a half. In fact, that's my earliest childhood memory is the night that my dad walked out on the family and he swung his white Navy duffel bag over his shoulder and he walked out into a dark rainy night. And, you know, I only had a very limited relationship with my dad. Um, he came back around about three and a half, four years later when I was seven and a half years old. And between seven and 18, I only saw my dad four or five times. And so I really had no relationship with him. And that affects you, right? And now you're invited into this relationship with God as dad, as father. And yet you don't even know quite how to conceive of that and how to experience that. And so we have to be really clear and really careful in our thinking about what Jesus means by calling us to address God as Father. What kind of Father is God? What kind of relationship are we being invited into with this Father? And so we need to let Jesus' description of God as Father shape our understanding of God as Father. And the best way to do that is to think about the well-known story Jesus told, the parable of the prodigal son. If you're not familiar with the story, you can find it in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, uh, Jesus tells this story of a dad that has two sons, and um, the younger of the two sons came to his father in great dishonor, great disrespect, completely contrary to the culture of the day. He comes to his father, and he ask really demands his father to divide the inheritance between him and his brothers even though his dad isn't dead yet this is in effect wishing his dad to be dead and this father does he's like okay if that's what you want and he divides 
the estate between his two sons. And then the younger of the son doesn't even value the family property, but liquidates the, his section of the family farm and then takes all the money, leaves home, goes to a far country, blows his money in just wasteful living, and then he finds himself in a famine. He's feeding pigs, which is you know goes completely against his Jewish heritage. Um, and he's starving and he's hungry. And finally, he comes to a census and he decides to go back home. Now, in Jesus' cultural context, everyone would know how the father should respond. Everyone would know and have a cultural expectation of what the father should do. The father had every right, culturally speaking, to either completely reject the son or certainly to punish the son when, upon his return home. But what does this father do? Here comes this wayward, bedraggled, in rags son who has blown not only a, a, a boatload of money, but he has sold off a chunk of the family land uh, to do so. And he comes um, dragging his, uh, his sorry self down the road. And what does this father do? Well, the father in the story, as Jesus tells us, he's watching and looking down the road and he's waiting uh, with anticipation for his son to come home. And the father sees the son when he's a long ways off. And he knows how the rest of the villagers would respond. He knows that the rest of the villagers would uh, respond with hostility and anger towards the son who has shamed his father and, sh and brought dishonor to the village. So this father gets up from where he's watching and he races down the road, and he greets his son, and he hugs, and he kisses his son. The son has this prepared speech of apology, and the father cuts him off in the middle of the speech. No groveling here, and he orders his servants to bring uh, the, the, the best robe, and bring the ring, and bring sandals for his feet, and he throws a party for the son who has come home. That, my friends, is the kind of father that Jesus has in mind when he says, pray to our Father in heaven. It's this kind of father. So whatever experience of dads you've had in your own life, this father in Jesus' story is unlike any father whatsoever. He is completely unique, completely incredible, and full of mercy and grace. And that's who we pray to when we say, Abba, Dad our Father in heaven. It's this kind of Father that Jesus is inviting us to pray to. Commenting on this parable, Henry Nouwen writes, in this story of the Father and the wayward Son, all the boundaries of patriarchal behavior are broken through. This is not the picture of just a remarkable Father. This is the portrait of God, whose goodness, love, forgiveness, care, and compassion have no limits at all. Jesus presents God's generosity by using all the imagery that his culture provides while constantly transforming it. And so we come to a father with this kind of heart, this kind of love, this kind of compassion, and we address him as dad, as Abba, as father. And we are invited into a relationship of close intimacy with him. Kenneth Bailey tells a story in his book on Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes about teaching about Abba, the word Abba and God being a father in a Middle Eastern village a number of years ago. And as he was teaching, he was explaining how this word meant father and it was the word, the language of the household and all of that. And he's explaining, he's got this group of women in this Bible study and he's explaining what father meant to them and, or what Abba meant to them and how they used it and all of that. And there was sort of this kind of awkward looking around of the women amongst themselves. And all of a sudden one woman in the back kind of slowly raises her hand a little nervously and shyly. And Kenneth Bailey says, yes, is there something that uh, I need to know or something you need to say? And this woman in the back says, well, the, the word Abba, we still use that today. In fact, it's the very first word we teach our children. Um, even though these were Arabic-speaking communities, they had preserved the, the heritage of the word Abba from their Aramaic past, distant past, and they taught that to their children as the very first word that they, they learned to address their, their dad as Abba with the language of closeness and affection and respect and intimacy. 
And that's who God is. God is this this father, this dad that we address with intimacy and with respect and with honor and with closeness because he's so incredibly good to us. So in letting Jesus teach us how to pray, this is who we pray to. We pray to our Father in heaven, our dad, who loves us with incredible mercy and compassion, with incredible steadfastness and faithfulness. Dad, like this, Abba, that's who we pray to. And so as we learn to pray from Jesus, this is really the first lesson, that the relationship we have with God is this relationship of intimacy, closeness, family. We don't need to pile up all the descriptives. We don't need to use all these different terms. We don't need to use all these really glorious, great terms. We simply need, like a son or a daughter, to come to God as Abba, as Father, as Dad, with closeness and intimacy. And if we struggle with that, we let Jesus' description of Dad slowly inform our understanding of who God is and what God is like. And we learn to pray in this kind of close, family-like relationship with, with the person who loves us more than we will ever understand. In fact, just as those ladies informed Kenneth Bailey that Abba was the first word they taught their kids, this should be the first word we learn in prayer, Abba, Dad. And so may you pray with confidence, knowing that you have a Father in heaven who loves you more than anyone else in the universe possibly does. So I would encourage you right now at this point to just pause and pray to your Father in heaven, knowing how much he loves you. Hey, thanks for joining me in this episode of The Bible in Life. I look forward to talking to you again soon next week. God bless you guys, and we will talk again next week.